I think I'll go ahead and put up the first slide since it provides a nice That's little. Great. Hi everyone, if you are joining us, welcome. Please settle in. We're gonna get started with this webinar in about a minute or two. So thank you for getting here promptly and on time and we'll get started in just a few moments. So thank you for joining us. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, whether it's your morning or afternoon, depending where you are in the country. Thank you so much for finding the time on this Tuesday after a long weekend to join us to talk about advocacy with farmers markets. So I'm mean, gonna get us started. I think we'll keep seeing folks trickle in today, um, but this webinar will also be recorded for those of you that might need to duck out early or something comes up. So. Um, we'll be making sure to send that out to everybody who's registered and it'll be in our resource library after this event. So to get us going, welcome. My name is Hannah Fuller. I am the communications manager for the Farmers Market Coalition. Um, I'll be here in the chat with my colleague, Michael e. McGowan, who is our communications associate to help you all with any tech issues and, and being, dropping resources and anything you might need. Um, a little bit about the Farmers Market Coalition to get us started, just in case you are unfamiliar with our work. Um, the National Farmers Market Coalition, we are a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to working with farmers market operators to strengthen farmers market organizations across the U.S. so they can serve as community assets while providing real income opportunities for farmers. We do this through a variety of support and resources and marketing and one of our main things that we do is we also serve as the national voice for farmers markets in advocacy efforts. And so I'm going to drop our link to our website just in case you haven't seen it before and you want to explore. We have a lot of resources there like our resource library that I mentioned earlier. You can keep up with our events, subscribe to our newsletter, social media pages, all those things. We're really excited to connect with you. If you are a farmers market organization, we hope you'll join us as a member and please reach out at any time. I'm really excited to introduce our executive director, Ben Feldman, today. Um, so Ben has been working with farmers markets for a, a 
very long time. He has a long history of nonprofit leadership within the food system and here at FNC. Prior to his current role as our executive director, Ben worked as our organization's policy director and served as a board member. His career includes helping found the California Alliance of Farmers Markets, running the California Market Match Program, championing equitable food systems policy on the local, state, and national level, and running the first farmers market on a Kaiser Permanente campus. So in his current role as our executive director, Ben oversees external partnerships and sponsorship. He takes questions from our media partners and, our, and does our board relations. And he also oversees all of our federal policy advocacy. Ben has a deep knowledge of how farmers market organizations can really, really engage with these policy issues that we're seeing um, at all levels of our food system. And we um, like to work at the national scale here at FMC, but we couldn't do it without all of you in your local communities and working on the ground. So with that, I will, I will pass it off to Ben. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us on our advocacy toolkit walkthrough as we um, build up to National Farmers Market Week. Uh, so let's jump into it and, and really to start with um, focus in on, on why we're talking about this. We'll get to the toolkit itself, but to start with, um, take a minute to ground ourselves in why we engage in policy advocacy. Uh, and, and really, it, it, it's quite simple. Our, our political systems aren't um, broken, they're functioning exactly as they're intended. And, and when I say that, I mean that they are dominated by powerful um, moneyed interests and the systems um, that exist are, are really intended to keep those with access, um, power and money uh, in power um, and with money. But that is not to say that the situation is hopeless. Um, the, the most effective antidote um, to money in our politics um, is people. It, it's really the only thing that, that I've ever seen um, that can serve as that antidote. Uh, and it's people coming together, building community, um, forming coalitions, and demanding of elected officials um, the things that they need in order to support their community. And, and so that really shapes the way we approach policy advocacy. There are great opportunities for farmers markets, but again, farmers markets, um, farmers market operators have typically not been um, those in uh, positions of power within our political systems. Uh, and so it is necessary that we come together, work together, um, do grassroots advocacy, engage with our elected officials in order to make sure that policy doesn't happen to us, but that um, policies that support our needs as a community and as a sector are the ones that move forward um, rather than um, policies that may uh, either um, have unintended consequences for us or may be specifically designed to put um, the farmer's market sector at a disadvantage. Um, so what does effective policy engagement look like? Really, this is all about relationship building uh, by and large your opportunity to engage with your elected official is, it, um, has a lot to do with how um, effective a relationship you have with them. And this is something that we saw very strongly during COVID. Um, during the early days of, of the COVID pandemic, farmers markets were struggling to make the case that they were essential services in the same way that grocery stores uh, were treated. And um, those markets that had strong relationships or those um, low geographies where there were strong ties between the farmer's market community and elected officials were much more um, able to carry those messages and were much more likely to be able to um, be deemed uh, essential services and remain in operation. The other thing is it's much more effective when you have when you're combining data and stories so you can speak to the individual impact. You, may, you can give a, you know, an example of, of what is happening, say, among your farmers who participate in your market or um, the, the market itself, and then also being able to use that data. And, and just to quickly to provide um, an example of, of why this type of thing um, is important and how it can work, um, some of you may remember um, the pandemic relief um, grant funding, the, the PRS grants that came out of USDA Agricultural Marketing Service. And you may remember at, when those were initially released, 
Uh, the only types of nonprofits that were going to be eligible for them were 501c3s. For FMC to be able to come and say uh, about two thirds of farmers markets that are incorporated as nonprofits are not 501c3s, um, and about two thirds of all of the markets in the country uh, are nonprofits, means that you'd be leaving about 40% of the, the farmers markets ineligible um, to apply for these grants. That really had an impact on USDA. They went back, they revised their, um, their approach, and as a result, all nonprofit types were eligible for those pandemic relief um, grants. And, and that's a, a perfect example of um, how important data is and, and just a little data point of data to back up your point really reinforces that. Uh, one of the most effective ways to start building these relationships is to invite decision makers to see your work coming out to market. We'll get to that in a minute within the toolkit. Um, giving them a role or an opportunity, um, elected officials, uh, you know, as it is our, their job to represent us um, as elected officials, but the way they get their job is by being seen and by being um, in a position where they their work is viewed positively. So being able to make that connection with the farmer's market, um, especially in a prominent role, um, is something that they definitely appreciate. Um, and then another piece uh, is a little bit less of a direct engagement strategy is about engaging the public. And, and this also can be particularly important um, if you may have uh, an elected official who either you've tried to build that relationship with and been unsuccessful um, for one reason or another on their front, or if you know, if we've definitely, um, I've definitely had folks say suggest, you know, our elected official um, doesn't represent our community particularly well. Um, we wouldn't want to have them out at market. Uh, it it would not be perceived well, uh, and and we couldn't wouldn't be able to get them out to market even if we wanted to. So there are other ways to influence um, elected officials to do policy engagement. Um, that that don't directly um, engage the elected official themselves, but um, may utilize the public to apply a certain amount of pressure on them as well. So um, with that in mind, let's go ahead and, and jump into the toolkit itself. Uh, so within the Farmers Market Coalition website, you can find our toolkit uh, on our advocacy section of our page, which the link is right there, and I'll click on it in a second just to walk you all through it. Um, but within the toolkit, there are um, there is a the proclamation template, the press release template, and the invitation um, to a, for elected officials to market template. Those are three pieces that we have created for all of you. Um, we've also got other things on there in addition to the advocacy toolkit itself. We have a video series about meeting with elected officials about farmers markets, which is produced um, by one of our board members, Gary Madison. We've also got uh, talking points, which includes um, data and statistics about farmers markets that you can use to make your points to elected officials. These are generally going to be um, the types of impacts that farmers markets have on communities, um, what the academic research is showing, uh, and additional information that you can use to help reinforce the specifics about your market. Um, and, and then we've also got information on federal programs. So let's go ahead and, and jump to the, the website itself. Uh, because that way we can walk through the toolkit. So um, under our advocacy section, you'll see um, that right here, we've got our links to a couple different pieces within the website. As I mentioned, um, the video series here under invite policymakers to market, our talking points, um, and the press release template, which is also uh, linked separately. And then the toolkit is just right here under explore the toolkit. So if you click on this link, it will open the toolkit document, um, which is a Google document that we update each year. Uh, working our way through the toolkit, you'll see um, there's just some intro at the beginning. And then the first section within the toolkit, um, once it loads, um, forgive me for uh, taking a second, but once it loads, you'll see um, that the first section is on advocacy versus lobbying. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but this is something that frequently comes up um, when we talk with our, our members about uh, what they can and can't do. Um, so, you know, just quickly, I'll, um, I'll mention, and then if, if folks are interested in this distinction, first of all, there's more information in the toolkit, and then um, I'll, I can go into some of the specifics later as well. But the most important thing to keep in mind 
is that as a private citizen, you have constitutional rights to engage in the political process and who you work for and what your job is has nothing to do with that. Now, if you do work for a nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit, there are restrictions placed on you, but that does not mean that as a private citizen separate from your work, um, you are not allowed to engage in advocacy. You absolutely can. And I would highly encourage you to do so, even if there are restrictions on um, your advocacy based on who you work for, whether it's a nonprofit um, or say a city. The other thing that's worth noting here is um, nearly all of the restrictions that exist for nonprofits are for 501c3 nonprofits only. 501c4, 5, 6 nonprofits pretty much um, can do uh, all of the lobbying activity that they want to do. Uh, and I'm going to leave it there for now, but um, oh, I, I actually, no, I'm going to say one other thing, and that is now 501c3 non, non, nonprofits absolutely can engage in lobbying activities. It just cannot be at, um, what's considered a substantial amount of your work. Um, that definition, um, there are a couple of tests for it, but by, it's generally considered to be around 10 to 20% um, of your organizational activities um, measured by budget or staff time. So that's just a reminder, pretty much regardless of who you are and who you work for, there are opportunities to engage in advocacy and lobbying activities. And most of what you would do um, in terms of meeting with elected officials, educating them about your work doesn't even fall into the lobbying category. So having gotten through that, um, one of the, the first things that, that our toolkit talks about is that building a relationship, um, as I, I mentioned, um, this is a this is really what it comes down to. Um, politics, ultimately, um, like so much of the rest of our work, is about these relationships that we build over time. Uh, and the the key piece here is that um, our suggestion is that this is one of the easiest ways that you can you can start to build this relationship is by inviting your member of Congress to the farmer's market. So um, right here under setting up a meeting, we've got an, um, the link to the invitation template, which is one of the key pieces of the advocacy toolkit. This is a, probably the simplest and easiest way to engage with your elected officials if you have not already done so. Um, even if you have, it's a super easy way um, that you can begin to build that relationship and where you are going to be the expert. You don't have to know anything about the policies that you're asking or that the, the, the politician is working on. Um, it's really just a place where you can invite them to a, um, a fun, easy experience, right? Coming out to the market is often going to be more interesting than some of the meetings um, or some of the more boring activities that they're invited to. It's also, again, a place where you're the expert and it really helps to cement both the what it takes to, to run many of the programs that you all are running. And uh, it really kind of, um, it, it de really demonstrates the impact, right? They're gonna be able to see uh, that the market serves, you know, however many farmers, 20, 40, 60 farmers, um, they'll see the customers. Um, and, and again, it's, it's a, quite a enjoyable experience and, and a good opportunity to be out in public doing something that um, by and large, there's universal support for, right? So there's, um, it, there's a, it's very much a positive opportunity for them. If there's an opportunity to find a connection to some activity that you all are doing, if you have something um, that's ceremonial, uh, pomp and circumstances, something that politicians typically love, it's part of how they, um, got into their job, nearly every politician, um, unless they're in a po an appointed position, nearly every politician got their position because they were elected into that role. And so um, being in the public eye is something that is typically um, they enjoy. And frankly, it's part of their job. Uh, so you know that connects to this promoting the visit, which also leads us to one of the other pieces that's within the toolkit. Um, that's the press release template. So this is your opportunity um, to reach out to the press. This tool, the, the press release template can be used for things other than um, a, a visit by elected officials to the farmer's market, but it's a great way um, to promote that as well. Uh, an easy way to, um, again, we were speaking, I spoke a little bit about the um, ways to engage the public um, around some of these issues. The press release template can be um, a great opportunity for that. Um, and then, 
you know, there's some, some um, guidance here to, to show off. Um, this is really, you know, your market is, is special. It's unique. Uh, it's something that you, um, again, are the expert on that nobody else is the expert on. We definitely encourage you to um, bring some data, especially if you have an ask that you want to make of your elected official. It's very appropriate um, to have an ask for them. It doesn't have to be um, as specific as voting on a, a specific way on a piece of legislation. Um, it can be as broad as um, you know, supporting farmers markets or um, if you do have a specific issue that's coming up for the market um, to raise it to them and ask for their support in trying to address it. Not everything um, is solved through uh, legislation or resolutions. Sometimes um, it's as simple as a connection within the city to the right department. Um, and again, here's just a little reminder about our talking points within the document. Um, so another important piece to all of this, especially relationship building, is that follow-up, um, taking pictures, posting them on social media, following up with the member, um, and their staff. And then um, the, the next piece to the toolkit um, are some resources to download. So this, again, we've got our, our talking points, um, our invitation template, the press release template, and the National Farmers Market Week proclamation template. Now, the, the proclamation template um, is something that uh, we developed in response to a member's request. Uh, as you all may know, each year, USDA proclaims uh, the first full week in August as National Farmers Market Week. And um, that's something that FMC works with to help make sure that that happens each year. But in response to some of our members asking, we produced basically a, a template version of that that can be used um, at the state, county, local, city level uh, so that your state, city, county um, can declare it your state Farmers Market Week um, or the city can declare it Farmer's Market Week. This is another great way, um, a very low lift to um, raise the profile, profile of farmer's markets in your community. Another way to build a relationship with elected officials. Um, and again, a pretty low touch uh, if you already, typically this is better if you may already have some sort of contact. But that said, many members of um, Congress or elected officials have um, a form by which you can reach out to them. Sometimes this proclamation process, um, it, there's already a pathway for it and you can simply submit it uh, in order to get that uh, created. This is another, the proclamation in addition to um, making elected officials aware of your market and its activities is also a great way to engage the press. Oftentimes um, they follow these proclamations that are um, created out of whatever body. And then when they come up, they will publicize them through their, their media source. So um, again, another one of these things that's sort of a, a twofer in terms of um, how, you're, how you're engaging. Um, and then the last thing um, I wanna uh, mention, um, so there's, there's just in here, there's also some guidance around sort of different types of elected officials um, at different levels. Um, definitely FMC, we work at the federal level. So that means we work with federal legislators, which is the House and Senate. Uh, we also work uh, with the, uh, with the um, excuse me, I'm just scrolling down here um, to get to the difference between um, sort of legislation and regulation. Regulations are what come through um, the administration or um, the federal agencies like USDA. And so our work at the federal level is with both elected officials and then um, the staff of USDA, which uh, are either appointed at the more senior levels um, or they are um, set staff who are hired through a public process. And it's worth noting um, that this, this distinction is um, mirrored at pretty much every level of the government, right? So there's, um, in addition to that at the state level or at the federal level, at the state level, you've got both your elected officials, your, your legislators, um, and then you've got your administrators, which are um, flow from the executive branch. So at, at the state level, that's um, from the governor's office. Um, and even in, in city government, you have something similar. So worth knowing there. Um, and again, I, even though FMC works at the national level, much of the work 
um, that most directly impacts farmers markets is happening at the local level. Um, your city council or your county board of supervisors is most likely the entity producing um, rules that most directly impact you. And, and so it may be that your best avenue is to build those relationships at that local level, um, start there. It's also a good place to start because those are the elected officials who are likely to go on um, and represent the state, um, either at the state level or at the federal level. And the last thing I want to mention in terms of resources that we have, um, while it's not under our um, advocacy toolkit, it is another um, product that we create, and that's our op-ed template, which is available um, on our website and through the full National Farmers Market Week toolkit. That's also an opportunity. We, we it's definitely a broad approach. You can simply use it to talk about how wonderful farmers markets are, but returning to this idea that you, there may be elected officials who... Um, you feel as though you'd prefer not to bring out to market and, and um, you'd really try to approach them or you, you haven't been able to build that relationship and you'd like to approach them differently. An op-ed can be a way for you to put your position out there, your voice out there on what needs to happen, um, even if uh, it's not that direct relationship. So um, both the press release template and the, um, the op-ed template are ways that you may be able to lean into that um, influencing your your um, elected officials without uh, directly meeting with them. So um, actually we're gonna take a second to, to pause there and just take a look. It looks like we've got a couple things um, in the chat, see if we've got any questions. Um, so if folks have questions about the toolkit, um, it looks like most of our um, chat comments are from our our staff just throwing in the wonderful resources we've got. Um, but if there are folks who have questions or comments on the toolkit itself, we, we can um, happily to entertain those now, or we'll just take a second to talk about um, FMC's farm bill priorities, uh, which I know is not part of our toolkit, but um, since we have a captive audience here, I think it'd be a great opportunity to show us sort of where, show you all where we are headed um, based on our feedback uh, that we've received from our members over the course of the last few years and implementing the last farm bill. Hannah, I saw you unmute yourself, is there? Yeah, I guess I just have a question um, about, you know, the all of this is really exciting and I think really important. I'm curious if you have any examples to share, if you've seen farmers markets engage their board around some of this work. I know a lot of managers are really busy and it's a busy time of year. And if you have any advice for a busy market manager and, and how they could potentially pull in other folks in their community to help them with some of this advocacy work. Yeah, that's a great, a great um, point. And um, really, in, in especially in, in thinking about how um, organizations are structured, a board is a great um, resource for you in terms of building those relationships. Um, and sometimes um, can, depending on your comfort level or the organization structure can be um, a way to demonstrate more engagement, right? If it's coming from um, the members of the board uh, or an official um, resolution from the board asking your city to um, put forward a proclamation. Um, sometimes those are, um, it, it can be even more effective ways to demonstrate that there's broad support. Many, many, many market organizations have things like community advisory committees or other um, groups that their role is to sort of serve as a liaison to the community. So those can be great re, um, assets um, to engage with. And then, of course, there's also farmers and customers, um, and depending on your level of um, engagement and, and how you'd like to approach it. That's really where farmers markets can really start to tip the scales um, by having your farmers and your community members participate in these types of processes. Um, you really are demonstrating just how broad the support for the market is and, and um, in showing to your elected officials that um, there is not just a single individual who is um, talking about the market, but people from potentially, you know, every um, uh, district within the city, you know, every city council district or um, 
every district within the Board of Supervisors, or, or you know, maybe even every district in the state. Uh, and, and that's really powerful. Uh, that's how, you know, to, to the point I was making earlier about um, people coming together, you know, that's really how we're going to long term be able to build uh, a really powerful coalition to support farmers markets. Um, we've been seeing more and more markets saying like, we really need the support of our communities, uh, especially when things like COVID happen. And um, so that broader engagement will be critical for us to be able to do so. Um, so yeah, thank you, Dar. Um, yeah, even just, you know, having some of our materials that are, uh, that your, your folks are using can, can help create that broad support. So I'm going to move into just walking you through, through a little bit, um, our farm bill priorities here. Um, again, happy to, to take any questions as they come. So feel free to put them in the chat. Um, while I'm doing that, I'm going to ask for something that I should have done at the outset, which was um, I'd love um, to know who we've got on the call today or uh, the webinar today. So if you could just drop your name, the market that you're associated with, um, that is, if you work for a market or just the one you shop with, if you're a board member, whatever that looks like. Um, and then the last thing you contacted any elected official about. Um, and if you've not contacted your elected official in the past, that's fine. Just say you haven't. Um, but it would be really helpful to know um, who's on the call. Um, so your name, the organization or market that you're associated with. Um, and then the last thing you contacted your member of Congress with. So, uh, excuse me, not member of Congress, any elected official um, should have done that at the beginning. But uh, love to have a better sense of, of who's here and uh, what your level of experience with uh, engaging your elected officials are. So having said that, and having threatened to talk about our farm bill priorities a couple of times, I'm gonna do that now. Um, overall, we really have um, two key, or really it all can come into one key farm bill priority. And that is about expanding access to federal grants and providing additional support to grantees and potential grantees, particularly um, with the goal of increasing engagement um, and utilization of these programs um, by uh, BIPOC farmers and market operators. So this is really focused on two types of grant programs. One is the local agricultural marketing program grants, which are the farmers market and local food promotion program. And then the Gus Schumacher nutrition incentive program Within the LAMP grants, uh, we are very focused on developing a simplified application process for small dollar amount grants. This has been something that has been ongoing for many years. Um, and anybody who's ever applied for this, or um, maybe even more importantly, looked at the application and decided that it is not for you, that is um, one of the biggest uh, goals that we have is to actually have a simplified application. We've approached USDA um, and Congress about simplifying the process and, and using sort of some of the, um, the efforts that are out there, you know, the Paperwork Reduction Act and all of that stuff unsuccessfully. Um, and so now we are taking a more um, specific and targeted approach uh, that will be um, at this point, you know, looking like we're borrowing some, from some other programs, uh, other grant programs that have more um, specifics, and, and it's probably um, at this point under $100,000 and um, would be for specific sets of activities. Uh, but we know that there's uh, a number of, of different primary um, activities that folks apply for. So trying to create that simplified application process. Um, second is reducing or eliminating match requirements. Obviously, this is a huge barrier as well. Um, and if we were successful at eliminating the match and simplifying the application process, that would probably be the single biggest um, thing that we could do to make the, the process by which LAMP grants are given out more equitably. Um, and then providing funding for training, outreach, and support for both grantees and potential grantees, um, and really doing so in a manner that um, supports the needs of organizations who are in this um, very early stage process. We know often um, technical assistance that's provided um, doesn't necessarily meet all of the needs and that there's a big 
gap um, that occurs when entities successfully apply for an application, especially the first time, and then they're in a position of figuring out what it means to actually comply with federal grants, which may be unexpected. On the GUSNIP side, that's the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. Um, in addition to um, issues around match, uh, we're also really focused on maintaining opportunities for direct and local agriculture. And some of this is around program structure rules. Um, some of you all may remember there were some um, within with last year when the request for proposals come out, there were some challenges uh, and, and the way that RFP was written would have prevented pretty much all farmers markets in the country from participating in it. And so we had to do um, some 11th hour advocacy in order to ensure that that markets were able to apply. But, um, you know, if that's within the, um, if the clock is already ticking on the application deadline, that's a lot harder than if we have that codified and clear that that will no longer be an issue in the future. That's not to say there aren't other priorities that we have, especially um, work around EBT um, and some other um, smaller issues that we'd like to see in the Farm Bill, but um, these are specific to the Farm Bill activity. Um, you'll note not included in here is um, WIC program activities. That's largely because um, WIC is not part of the Farm Bill. It's part of the Child Nutrition Reauthorization. Um, and the other big thing that you may be wondering about that's not in here is our work related to EBT. By and large, we'll do that um, at the administrative level when I um, identified the difference between elected officials or legislators and um, members of the administration or um, the federal agencies, that's the difference between, say, Congress and USDA. And so we'll be doing most of our work on EBT with USDA and at the state level. So that is my final slide. I'm just going to look here. It looks like we've got um, a number of folks. Um, thank you so much for joining us um, during this presentation. It looks like it's mostly introductions here. So if there are questions that you all have, I'd love um, to go ahead and open it up for questions. These could be questions related to the toolkit, our farm bill priorities, um, or things that um, aren't even in here, but uh, are, are policy questions that you all might have. Hannah, did I miss anything in the chat while I was talking? If there's anything that you spotted that I should respond to. Nothing that I spotted, just some nice introductions. It looks like we've got a, a wide variety of folks here. And we can hang out for a bit. And if folks don't have any questions, we can wrap up a bit early. Like, like Ben mentioned, we um, all of this advocacy, all of these resources are available on our website under with the link that I dropped in the chat. Uh, resources like the updated op-ed te template and social media graphics and all those kind of core resources that you might look for FMC for in advance of National Farmers Market Week will be released in our updated toolkit on June 27th in advance of National Farmers Market Week, which lands on August 7th through 13th of this year. We have somebody asking about farmers market, senior farmers market coupons, Ben, and explaining a bit more about that program and how that program works. Yeah, um, it looks like Nadine had a question. Nadine, you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask the question and um, we can, I think we are in a webinar setting. So oh, we're in a webinar setting, able right? You might not be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I forgot about that. So, um, yeah. So, Nadine has, was asking a question about um, senior farmers market nutrition co coupons of Tamlin. So, um, Tamlin, feel free to um, give any response you might have in the chat. I will just um, mention the senior farmers market uh, nutrition program mirrors that mostly of the WIC. Farmers Market Nutrition Program, um, but it is, both of these programs are only administered in certain states. Uh, so some of the work that we have been trying to do uh, is to increase funding for both of these programs. The Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program is part of the Farm Bill and does have a pretty good um, base of support among members of Congress. Um, unfortunately, the WIC program um, 
somewhat less well supported, but both of these programs um, are in need of, of additional support and funding in order to make sure that all states are able to access them. Um, and the other big issue that we're seeing with these programs is that in particular, as states are moving to an electronic WIC program, they're also now starting to look at um, moving their farmer's market nutrition programs into electronic formats, uh, which more or less is replicating the same set of inequities that we saw when the SNAP program went electronic. Uh, and there are even more restrictions on how those programs will be administered. So um, not to be a bearer of bad news, but if these are programs that you work on, um, definitely something to keep your eye on and, and potentially reach out to your um, your officials about because uh, is that they are, um, there's a potential for these programs to be rolled out in a way that is not supportive of farmers markets, another important opportunity to engage. Um, sounds like and um, we've got a specific issue where the coupons are going out, but number coming out to the local market. I'm um, trying to figure out why. Sounds like an interesting um, challenge. Uh, and Nadine, to your point, no um, participants do not necessarily need to qualify for SNAP. There's a couple different ways they can demonstrate eligibility um, for those programs, but it is not necessarily um, through SNAP. Um, Timlin, if, if there's anything we can do to support with that challenge, happy to um, help out. Uh, it definitely, these types of challenges around the SNAP and WIC, or excuse me, around the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the WIC program, um, they feel very familiar. Part of the challenge is that these programs are uh, um, often administered um, with in, involvement from multiple agencies. Um, often it, the the at the state level, there's an agency, whether it's Department of Agriculture or Department of Social Services that is responsible for producing the checks. They then pass those along at to some cases to the county um, or local agencies who then distribute them. Um, and sometimes there are, there are delays in that process um, or there's misinformation that's being conveyed. Um, so it's definitely a challenge. Um, and if there are folks who are experiencing that challenge, happy to do our best to give you all some support. Looks like there's some good conversation here in the chat about that. Um, yeah, folks talking about the county, um, county commission on aging, that's often your best resource. Um, so as is always the case, um, members of our, our community have some of the answers to help you all out. Um, good to see that happening in the chat. Unless there are additional questions, I think it's probably a good place for us to, um, to end our, our presentation for today. Um, Hannah, any last words? No, just uh, please connect with us, whether that's on Facebook or uh, whether that's emails. We've got a contact page on our website, so we hope that you'll engage with us. And it's these rich conversations in the chat that help inform our work. So thank you all for joining us today and keep an eye out for the recording of this session as well as other resources on our website. And we'll uh, see you in another webinar again soon. So thank you all.